there's only so much can be done in terms of the design of microprocessors to make them more energy efficient. Um, the, the progress in computing over the first 60 years since the first programmable computer, which ran its first program, in fact, in Manchester in June 1948, we're now just over 60 years since then. And the, if you measure the energy efficiency of, of a modern ARM processor and compare it with the Manchester machine, you'll see that we've improved by a factor around 100,000 million over those 60 years. Um, it, it's, it's an astronomical rate of progress. You know, cars, if cars had got more efficient at the same rate, then one litre of fuel would keep the entire UK road transport population going for a year. Um, now, there are good engineering reasons why it's hard to make cars efficient at the same rate as computers, but the, the progress in computer energy efficiency has just been phenomenal. And, and, and that's why we have all these mobile computing products now. Uh, progress is continuing in that area, um, but a lot of the progress has actually been down to uh, the way the computers are made rather than the way they're designed. The design has contributed but it's the base technology, in other words, it's, uh, it's really Richard's area of the game that's made the huge difference in the technology. Um, the designers and architects such as myself have, have, have had a small influence, useful but, but not dominant. Um, and that will continue, we're still making progress on energy efficiency of machines. If you want to be you know, at the top of the Premier League Manchester United or, or Chelsea, um, it doesn't come that cheap. Yeah. Um, and if you want to win, you've got to be at the top of the Premier League. Yeah. Um, the, the, the David Sainsbury's report, The Race to the Top, so I'm quoting all these things because I've read them recently, shows an astonishing correlation of venture capital investments into spin-offs from universities against their academic quality measured in the research assessment exercise. So, so how do you get the brainiest people when there is a global market for the brainiest people? You, you, you have no choice but to play to win. My frustrations with, with today's technology is that uh, back in the late 1980s at Acorn we had the early ARM machines which ran a graphical user interface which was fluid and when you asked it to do something, it did it straight away. And today we have microprocessors which are um, a thousand times more powerful, and yet the software manages to make them feel slower. <laughs> um, and, 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 and this is quite an impressive achievement. Um, on the other hand, there are some very good examples of user interfaces. So, so um, of course, Apple sells its product on the basis of the quality of its user interface, particularly the iPhone. Um, which shows what can be done if you're careful enough. Um, I, th I think they're extremely important to, to the usability of the technology. I mean, the, 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 with a product such as a mobile phone, nobody cares. Most people don't even know what microprocessor is inside there. Um, there are probably several, but they still don't care. I mean, what they care about is, is, is how um, the software engineers make the technology usable at the front end. And um, that's been very difficult because, because the technology has been moving so fast, uh, as I've described earlier, that, that, that essentially you don't get time to develop and stabilize a particular style of user interface before it's obsolete because the technology's moved on a, another significant step. So we're always essentially working with prototype software. Um, and, and a lot of it feels like that. It'll be nice, perhaps, when Moore's Law slows down and we give the software guys a chance to catch up. Well, the, the bit where there appears to be a, um, a consensus, at any rate, the words apparently are the same, um, is that we have to um, rebalance the economy um, away from investment banking um, and towards manufacturing. Uh, and all parties seem to say that. And I mean, the, the first test is whichever government we end up with, uh, does it see 
the research base in the UK universities, which actually has improved very considerably in the last 13 years as an asset or as a luxury? I mean, I agree entirely with Richard that, that the last decade or so have, have been one of the best for science and engineering in, in the history of uh, the UK research economy. Um, and it's hard to imagine, under whatever government takes power in May, that uh, the next 10 years will be as good. Um, uh, because of the financial position that we find ourselves in now. I, I think that, that, that there's a real question over the extent to which uh, the, the people that populate the House of Commons, whichever party they come from, um, the extent to which they uh, take time to understand the science and engineering issues, which actually underpin most of modern life. Um, it, it seems to me that science and engineering have, have sort of transcended being important, interesting subjects to being the infrastructure upon which we critically depend um, for everything from hospitals to schools to commerce. And, and, and that really one would expect any government um, to educate it rather better, educate itself rather better than one senses they have in the past. Um, now, there have been some changes. The, the number of chief scientific advisers in government is, is higher now than it has been in the past. Um, so they are seeking scientific advice. Um, but I think any responsible member of parliament ought to ensure that they themselves have a reasonable understanding of the science and technological issues because they're now so important.